Well, when uh, Bruce asked me to give this talk, he said I'd probably be the only one here who had a deposit named after him. I'm not sure that's a blessing or a curse, but hopefully in the near future we might find out. Um, I also suggested to him, or talked to him at that time, because this particular conference is about the Trek program, and the two-time spread was actually found before the Trek program came into being. However, we did use a lot of data from the Quest West program that Geoscience BC had undertaken a year or two before that we began doing the work in the area. And for that reason, uh, it, the work that Geoscience BC had done and is continuing to do is very helpful for those of us who are exploring in the province. There are a number of individuals and some groups that I want to acknowledge that have helped to support this work. Uh, perhaps most importantly is um, a company called Kootenay Silver. They used to be called Kootenay Gold. And Jim McDonald, who's uh, one of the, the president of Kootenay Silver, uh, contacted me in 2011. I'd been doing some consulting work for his company in the Purcell Mountains. And he contacted me and asked if I'd ever worked in the, Ch in the Nechaco. And I said, well, only peripherally. I'd worked in the Yukon and Northern BC and Alberta because I was in Calgary for 30 years. Um, but he said he wondered if there were anything that could be done with the existing geophysical database at that time to help prospecting in the area. So the idea that he came up with, is, and we came up with, is can we use those data to zero in on particular areas to try to focus uh, where there might be geologically interesting outcrops? The second group that I want to acknowledge very heartily here is the Kennedy Group of Prospectors. This is a family of prospectors out of Kimberley, BC. That they've been prospecting in that area for, well, Craig's been doing it probably for 50 years now. And they were working, starting to work in the uh, Nechaco Basin in 2010, I believe. And in order to do so, they contacted one of the well-known prospectors there, a fellow named Fred Critchlow, Fred number one. And when I went up there in 2011, I was working with Craig Kennedy. And it was Craig's work with me back and forth, the discussions back and forth. How did the geophysics relate to the geology? How does the prospecting relate to the area? that we ended up finding it. So there are a lot of things I'd like you to take away from this talk, but the, the three I think that are most important are listed here on the slide. The first is that the two times Fred discovery was made in 2011 by combining regional geophysics and focusing on particular areas and then zeroing in on those areas with good old hammer, sledgehammer prospecting to find whatever we could find. Uh, since then, there have been a number of, of um, studies, ongoing studies, uh, including ground geophysics, surface prospecting, sampling, uh, and eventually drilling in 2015, have defined a fairly large area. It's, it's at least three kilometers by one kilometer, uh, where the outcrops that exist, and they're few and far between, indicate that there's mineralization. The setting is interpreted to be the upper levels of an epithermal deposit, the base of which or the lower levels of which we don't know too much about at the present time, but could go on some distance. In other words, the deposit could be significantly enhanced at depth. So how do we do this? Well, when I started working in the area in 2011, I initially went out and got as much of the geophysical database as I could, and that included, of course, the regional NRCAN data, the magnetic and gravity data that NRCAN had has published on their websites for years. And this is actually a map taken from the NRCAN after I downloaded it and reoriented it, taken from their website, the Geoscience um, Data Repository. It shows you basically where we're looking. Uh, Vanderhoof is up in the upper right. The two times Fred is 20 kilometers southwest of Vanderhoof. So it's fairly close to some population. So it's a fairly easy area to work. Uh, you can see its relationship to Blackwater there. Uh, when I started working the area, when I was working the area with Craig Kennedy up in the north, Craig told me that he had had many discussions with Fred Critchlow. Critchlow. Now, I never met Fred, unfortunately, before he passed away. But what Craig told me at that time when we were driving around looking at the rocks is that one of the things Fred did was to take magnetic data and look for donuts. Now, what did he mean by that? 
Well, when looking for donuts, what he was looking for were caldera-like structures related to magmatic activity at depth and epithermal and, at higher levels, hydrothermal alteration. So by doing the kind of work I was talking about, by taking the geophysical data and zeroing in on particular locations, this is one of the things we found. This is a, a highly silicified, layered, looks flow banded in places, has lots of cavities, hematite alteration, and this turned out to be the first sample from the two times Fred that ended up with something <coughs> of interest. When Craig told me that, that, that Fred Critchlow liked to look for magnetic donuts, that made sense to me as a geophysicist because it is not unusual for magmatic areas that have undergone um, near surface structural development could form things like caldera-like structures. Caldera-like structures tend to be circular or semicircular in orientation. And so looking for donuts or circular or semicircular magnetic structures makes some geophysical and geological sense. So in this diagram, it, it shows the basic idea uh, magmatic activity at depth, structures forming near the surface that could be circular-like in shape. Well, I want to zero in on one of those areas right now, just to the southwest of Vanderhoof. That is the two times Fred donut. We didn't know that at the time, but this was one of the areas that I was interested in looking. What I did in 2011, going into an area fairly green without an awful lot of detailed geophysical data is to say, what can I do here with the database that exists? At about, at about that time, 2010 or so, I think is when the, the data from the Quest West survey became public. So I took the eastern part of the Quest West survey and the national database and did some various types of manipulation. When we zero in on that, on that magnetic semicircular structure, if you will. This is what it looks like in some detail. And there are a number of interesting things that show up. Probably the most interesting to me is there, there's this semi-linear pattern at the south of this semicircular donut. And I've always thought that this linear pattern is a shear zone or a fault. But there's no fault that shows up on the geological maps in the area, at least that has this orientation. So we're not really sure what that is yet. You'll see that there are two sample locations located here, labeled A14-3 and 14-5. What I did was I took the geophysical data that were provided by Geoscience BC and provided by um, the National Database, and I, I did some comparisons between the two. And one of the databases that I use from Geoscience BC is the Airborne EM. And that's what's shown here for the east block or east block two of the Quest West survey. Now when we look for EM features, what we're typically would like to think we're looking for is metal. Of course, EM can respond to things like cultural activity and fluids and uh, carbon. But I, I, I said, let's take the EM information and let's cross correlate it with the magnetic information. Now what does that mean in a in a geological and a practical sense. What it means is we want to compare the two and find where they have places where they compare favorably and places where they don't. What I was interested in is finding places that might, be, might have metal that also had interesting magnetic characteristics. So we took the EM database from the Airborne EM, and this is a blown up portion of it in the region around two times Fred, and you'll see some some electromagnetic highs, that's what the reds represent here. Uh, the, the highs to the north and to the east of this diagram are probably associated with Vanderhoof. So we try to sort of ignore those, we filter those out in our minds, but these that have the samples on them are not. These are 25, 30 kilometers southwest of Vanderhoof. Uh, when Craig and I were out in the field, we were wandering around the area around what's labeled A14-3 there and to the east of that. And we found a number of places that I'd identified based on the geophysical work I'd done. I think I identified 15 of them and we had time to look at six or seven. Every single one of them except one had some kind of alteration. Now most of them, the alteration was really high level, like opal in, in the volcanics. We sampled those and generally didn't find much. There were a couple that, that the geophysical analysis had focused in on 
that the Kennedys had actually already found as, as prospects in the year prior to when I was there. So when I, I saw that, I was pleased that maybe we were doing something that was leading us somewhere. So when I went out in the field in 2011 with Craig, Craig I wandered, we wandered around to, we could, to do, look at six of these. And on one of the last days we were looking, it always works that way, I'm sure. Um, we'd found some andesitic volcanics with opal in them. We'd sampled them and we were getting kind of discouraged at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, Craig, this structure seems to be projecting up to the northeast. I see there's a new road over there. Let's go take a look. So we did take a look and this is what we found. It's kind of underwhelming when you look at it <laughs> in a photograph like this, but actually that's a one meter thick silica vein. And that silica vein is where this sample came from. This sample assayed at half a gram per ton of gold. So a good sign. We're onto something here. Um, we went back to the motel and at night Craig called up his son and Kimberly and said, Sean, why don't you throw a couple of claims on this? And he did that night and he's the one who called it the two times Fred after Fred Critchlow and yours truly. So what has happened since we discovered it in 2011? There have been a lot of surveys. The Kennedys have been up there every year since. They've, they've um, acquired more than 370 rock samples, some of these in trenches, some of these by doing rock prospecting in the perimeter. There have been 18 trenches that have been dug. There is a ground-based geophysical survey of VLF and magnetics. And there are many drill holes that have, uh, that have been um, drilled. So let me start with how we, what we've found since then with respect to the rocks, or what they've found since then. I haven't been up there and collected since 2011. This is from the map of the area, the geological map of the area, overlaying on the magnetics. Now, there are a couple of things you can see here, I hope. First of all, there are some faults on the geological map None of them has the orientation of this magnetic structure, if you will, this magnetic anomaly, this magnetic gradient at the south end where it says uh, Indaco and Chilcote and Basalt, you can see. I, as I've labeled it, I think it might be a shear, but we don't have any direct evidence for that at this time. The second thing to notice is that there is a lot of basalt around. Now, what the Kennedys have found is that the silica veins penetrate into these basalts. So obviously the silica veining is younger than whatever the ages of those basalts are. Those basalts have not been dated here, so we don't know for sure. They're interpreted as indaco, so we're looking at silicification that's probably Eocene or younger. In terms of the samples that have been collected, this shows a plot of all 374 of them. You can see they're in a fairly localized area. A few of them are south of this thing I call the shear zone. Most of them are north because that's what they were finding uh, as, as they worked in the field. What I've put on here in colored version of the same diagram is uh, a, a series of the samples with values of gold greater than 100 parts per billion, greater than a tenth of a gram per ton. And one of the interesting things you can note from that is that all of them occur north of that shear zone, north of that magnetic gradient. Maybe that's fortuitous, maybe it isn't, but that might be the southern limit of the two times fret. We don't know at the present time. Elsewhere, to the north, to the east, and even to the west, it's open. We don't know where it goes or how big it is because a lot of it's covered by younger basalt and we can't see it. And where it isn't, the exposure is really quite poor. So it's hard to find things. So it's open in three directions on the surface. In addition to that, a couple of years ago, uh, Sean and his brothers found an, a couple of pretty nice samples there. Uh, you can see they're labeled 11.4 and 12.8. That's 12,000 ppb, so 12 grams per ton of gold. Those are all gold values. In addition, in 2013, there was a, a ground-based VLF survey that was run. Uh, that's the rectangle on the left. There were four VLF lines run north-south. One of the things that we can do with VLF data, VLF is an EM technique to look at the very shallow 
upper tens of meters for electrical conductors. One of the things we can do with VLF data these days is to invert the data. That's something that's fairly new. And what I did here is I, I applied inversions to the four lines and then combined them into a quasi 3D structural diagram. And that's what's shown here. The red blobs represent conductors, electrical conductors greater than 15 millisiemens per meter. Uh, you can see the easting and northing numbers in the, in the lower left part of the diagram. The total depth of that, of that cube is on the order of 300 meters, although we're probably not getting signal down that deep. What's interesting, no problem, in the left of this diagram, you see this big round blob in the, in the subsurface there. That sits right underneath what we call the borrow pit discovery. The discovery was made in the borrow pit, and that red blob is about 50 to 80 meters below that. We don't know what it is. Um, off on the right side of the diagram, you see these little green squares. Those are the locations of the eight drill holes that were drilled in 2015. Now, all of the drill holes except one are less than 100 meters depth. There's one of them that goes down to 195 meters in terms of if it's angled distance. So it's in terms of true depth, it's more like 140 or 150. Every one of the drill holes that's been drilled has intersected a gold bearing vein at depth. And many of them have intersected two or three of them. You see the, uh, on this cross section, the purple represents the basalt, the Eocene basalts. You can see the drill sections on there, uh, some of them intersecting two, or two veins or, uh, or more in a couple of cases, and all of them with anomalous gold. There are a number of things we don't know yet. We don't know the lateral extent of the two times thread. We don't know how far north it goes. It's probably delineated on the south. We don't know that for sure. We've only got six samples south of that uh, magnetic gradient. We don't know its eastern limit. We don't know its western limit. We don't know the depth extent of the anomalous metals. The, the drilling to date, as I said, is only one hole that's 195 meters in distance. The age of mineralization, we don't really know at all, except that it postdates some of the basalts there. Assuming those are Indaco, then it postdates the Indaco basalts, but in that location, the Indaco hasn't been, been uh, uh, dated. We also don't know whether additional geophysics, things like IP or additional EM, some controlled source EM, might help us in delineating the subsurface structure and geometry of whatever is producing the anomalous gold and silver and other metals. So let me finish with this. Uh, the two times Fred discovery was made by taking the geophysical data from a regional scale down to an outcrop scale to the best of our ability before we could actually go out in the field and test things and check it. Have to do that. Ongoing surface prospecting, ground geophysics and shallow drilling has defined an area that's one kilometer by three kilometers at least. It's probably bigger than that. It has an highly anomalous gold, silver, and other metals, but gold is the primary metal of interest here. And finally, that the, uh, that the setting is interpreted to be the upper levels of an epithermal deposit. The drilling indicates that it has quite a significant depth extent but we don't know how far deep it goes. So of the five possible directions, northeast, south, and, and, and northeast, southwest, and subsurface, four of them, it's open uh, in those directions. So I think there's a lot more to do there. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Fred, and uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, this morning for this opening session. Now, it's been a bit like an aquarium up here where uh, you're all looking at us, swimming around and bumping our noses into the glass. And we all have very sore necks, so now we're going to turn around and look at you. And uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so uh, where we are uh, in a position to take some questions. Uh, we've got a roaming microphone uh, uh, that uh, Rich has in the back if you have some, uh, some uh, burning questions to ask. And if you don't ask questions, uh, I've got a few questions myself I'd like to prime one with. And I don't know where we're at with in terms of technology, in terms of uh, remote questions. Um, I'll, I'll let Sean uh, put them up if they did happen to uh, get that fixed. Okay. Okay. 
beautiful. So um, if anybody has a question from the audience uh, for our folks, I see Colin Dunn's got question number one coming up here. And, uh, and you can either direct it to uh, anyone in particular or uh, you can direct it to the group. And, uh, and uh, let's have a little bit of a, a discussion for about 15 minutes or so. And then it's uh, coffee time. I've got a question for uh, New Gold Joel. Um, you indicated that the main stage gold has sericite associated with it? Yes, that's correct. Does it also have the budding tonight associated with it? Uh, no. Is that a little better? Let's pull it out. Um, we believe that there is no correlation to uh, with the budding tonight. Uh, and the core scan image is really the best evidence we have at this point, suggesting that uh, the, the ammonium bearing minerals are pre gold. Okay. Yeah. Uh, There's no sp spatial association that you're seeing? Well, uh, there is a gross spatial association. I mean, yeah. a spatial, spatial association. We do see ammonium bearing minerals in the core of the deposit. But where we've core scanned, we see some pretty clear paragenetic relationships, cross-cutting relationships okay. uh, to illite and muscovite, cross-cutting the ammonium-bearing minerals. Okay, because where this was leading is, um, had you tried looking at uh, the ammonia content of the soils as a prospecting tool? Ah, that's a really good question. No, no we have not. Um, probably the best person to answer this would be my uh, colleague, Joanna Lipsky. Um, but that's, uh, that's a really great suggestion. Look into that. Thanks, Colin. A uh, question from Colin. Yeah. Um, so this is for uh, Joel uh, Rotard mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> sure. I, I'm just wondering uh, why one couldn't, rather than stick with the epithermal category, call that a porphyry deposit. I mean, the rhyolite is a porphyry. Uh, you don't have the quartz veins. It's uh, the dating seems to it would it, it might match a porphyry category rather than an epithermal category. Any comments? Uh, I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, maybe my personal view is perhaps it sits somewhere in the middle. Uh, how do we explain those high temperature assemblages? Um, when we think of epithermal deposits, typically we think of them towards the surface. And what if you know black water was buried? This is probably not my suggestion. I think this has been offered uh, by others uh, in the room that know a lot more about it than I do. But uh, that would help explain uh, the, the high temperature assemblages. Um, but do we, you know, do we see hydrofracking and all the uh, repeated generations of veinings that you typically see in a porphyry deposit. No, we don't quite see that, but perhaps it just sits a little bit deeper in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, hi, this one is for, for Craig. Um, just looking at that fault map from the, from the gravity, um, how well did that compare with the faults mapped with, um, you know, on the ground by geologists? Because just from intuition, I would, if you're um, overlaying all the upward continued grids and using the central highs as your faults, wouldn't that be mapping out the center of the unit instead of the fault? Well, from, oh yeah, sorry, thanks. Uh, no, you're right. There are some things that were clearly shifted, right? And that's, and that's, and that's why. But generally speaking, what we found with the uh, upward continued, when we were looking at the surface, uh, the near surface expression or the near surface um, uh, upward, con upward continued to the upper sort of uh, you know, half kilometer or so, that we found there was generally pretty good con uh, correlation with the geology that was found on the ground. But as soon as we started going down into the deeper sections, we found there was less and less. And probably what's happening is in one, uh, one way of looking at it is that a lot of those structures are probably have a, have a dip associated with them. And so by the time we you sort of model what those structures look like, they're going to be fat and they're going to be moving off in one direction. So they're going to be displaced from a lot of those features. And so um, I was surprised that it, there was a correlation. But of course, we're correlating what is known to what is unknown. If you do it the other way around, we had lots of features that looked like they should represent something that represented nothing in the geology. But we don't know a lot about all of the geology either, and so you never know whether that's something that's real or, or not. And so 
that's really the important thing is getting the, the ground truth component out there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks. Yeah, the gravity doesn't see the overburden at all. The gravity doesn't even see the chocotin, right? We can, you know, we can map features that go right through all that chocotin. And so it's really looking at things that are down, you know, at least 500 meters to several kilometers. But it's airborne gravity? It's airborne gravity. So well, it's, well, it's, yeah, I think it's all, air, it's all different types of airborne gravity, yeah. Uh, ask a geophysicist that part. I don't know. There's, there's, that's math. That's not my thing. <laughs> okay, this is a broad question for everybody. But perhaps Joel MDRU could take it. I was just wondering, uh, is the reason we're not seeing mineralization in the Jurassic, Jurassic, Hazelton group in this area similar to what we're seeing in the northern Stikine uh, due to lack of outcrop, or is it perhaps some reworking of older mineralization is causing this Cretaceous Eocene mineralization in this area? Uh, yeah, that's a, an interesting thing to, to consider. There isn't a lot of the lower Hazelton rocks exposed in the Trek area, so it could be a, a product of, of uh, yeah, just a lack of the, the rocks being there. But, I mean, if, if, even with the amount that there is there, if there is the, the same degree of of early Jurassic mineralization as we see in, say, the Golden Triangle, you'd expect to see some record of it. So, like, the, the early Jurassic rocks that are exposed generally aren't very altered. So that makes me think that there's something else controlling that there, there isn't actually mineralization at that age in this area. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure that I follow the question. Well, I suppose in terms of isolating the mineral endowment, like the gold, copper endowment in the area today. Well, it, it, yeah, it could be reworking of that mineralization that's at depth. Like the, the sticking terrain has the potential to have that mineralization in it. So if it's reworked from depth at the, in this uh, former lower crustal mash zone, that's what ends up at the surface in the late Cretaceous. Uh, I think what we see in the Eocene is sort of a form of slab failure, but it's uh, breaking off at the west and that slab sinking. Uh, but during the early Eocene, there, there's a really good record of the slab being there in the form of magmatism in the coast plutonic complex. So it hasn't failed at that point. But, the, but the, the arc is continuous from the late Cretaceous through to the Eocene. Last terrain accretion collision event was in it was certainly over by the mid Cretaceous. Everything was roughly in its position as we see it now by then. Uh, so the the late Cretaceous, it's it's compression, but it's not collision. Uh, in one of the slides that I showed, you can see the the uh, coast plutonic op complex arc axis moved two kilometers per million years eastwards from 110 to 80 million years ago, I think that is part of the effect of what's causing the compression during the mid to late Cretaceous. So it's a, it, we have this possibly shallowing of the slab, essentially forcing everything eastwards and causing compression. 
So I just might take a moment here to recognize that we have had some uh, input from our online folks. And actually, Joel, uh, uh, someone's uh, offered some additional uh, advice on the ammonia question. And I think you might know this person. Yeah. <laughs> so if you might actually just read that, because it might not be large enough for the folks uh, at the back of the room to see. Okay, so Joanna says, I have an additional comment for Colin's question regarding ammonium at Blackwater. We've also detected ammonium-bearing minerals at, in Kasalka rhyolites outside of the deposit as far as four kilometers in unmineralized rock. Perhaps it is related to degassing of the rhyolites. Just another line of evidence that ammonium isn't linked to gold mineralization. Great, and then there's a, a question from Christine up in Smithers. So hello, Smithers, and thank you for, uh, for, for typing in today. That's a question directed at mm. uh, both Joel from Blackwater as well as Fred, uh, just to speak in a general sense about the role of public geoscience sure. and uh, geoscience BC's work in this particular area on your projects. Yeah, uh, in addition to Geoscience BC and the Trek project, of course we leveraged a lot of our efforts uh, on the Diacal map that Craig showed in his talk. Um, so all the, all the efforts going on between uh, the, the GSC, uh, the, the BCGS, and uh, Geoscience BC with the Trek project have been incredibly useful, particularly the MAG data sets. Uh, we did a huge AeroMAG survey over Blackwater and being able to incorporate that into a larger region uh, provided a whole lot of context with which we could uh, do further studies. Um, it allowed us to, to give us the confidence to engage uh, SRK Consulting to put together a, a nice structural report of the area uh, and that helped us with our targeting efforts uh, in 2014 and beyond. So yeah, it's been instrumental. Yeah, I'll just comment too, as I said in my talk, it was critical that we had the, not only the magnetic data from both Geoscience BC and from the national database, but also the airborne EM. It was the combination of the two that really led us to a number of areas to focus the prospecting on. Excellent, anything else from the floor before I maybe ask a question? Call in again, please. <laughs> uh, this is for uh, Craig Hart. I was just wondering if you had the opportunity of comparing your uh, gravity interpretation to uh, possible interpretation of the air, by air mag. No, I haven't done that yet. And I get, but I, I, I'll kind of come back again to that same sort of feature, or answer, or question before. You know, the little bit that I have done really shows that there is a good correlation between the shallowly upward continued uh, or downward continued, probably. Um, gravity and the mag, right? It really is the, the near surface expressions that, uh, that correlate. I have a question for you, Craig. It, is, is there a property scale uh, version of, of the fathom geophysical type work that, uh, or is it primarily for regional tectonic sort of framework uh, work? It looks, it looks very seductive uh, in terms of developing early understandings of, what an, of an area, but how much can you scale that down? Yeah, well, I think with, with Fathom, and it's just their algorithms, right? And many geological or geophysical outfits will have their own algorithms or their own approaches towards doing that. The most important thing is that there's a lot of variability in the rock types, and that's really what's required in order to get those contrasts that give you the confidence to say that there are structures or there are different, different domains there. And so, you know, within a property scale, you would want to make sure that you did have that sort of contrast in order to, to go forward with it. We've, you know, uh, throughout the world, there's a deficiency in geological um, surveys these days. They're underfunded, there's, uh, there are people are being retired and not replaced. And so what we've found is anywhere we go in the world, we can always build a better geological map. And that's because any of the maps that were made, usually in the 70s or something like that, uh, can be improved with the value of geophysical, with structures interpreted from the geophysics. And so that's sort of been our MO in going into any region is that we look at the geophysics, we slide it under the existing geology, and we can make it better every time. And so I think that's still the, actually the case in British Columbia, right? Even maps made here still aren't taking full, full value of the, the uh, publicly available geophysical data sets that exist there. And so I think it's always uh, possible to make a better geology map, like anybody, anywhere, at any scale, just by doing that. Okay, Fred, well, um, what would you do scientifically uh, 
to delineate veins better at 2-2M spread, looking ahead a little bit. Well, one of the things I mentioned I'd, I'd really like to see is a good IP survey, and IP perhaps along with resistivity. Uh, that should give us better control on whatever um, geophysical anomalies we might see in the near subsurface. And, and that is, IP has been a particularly helpful tool for gold explorations in a lot of areas. Excellent. And then, and Joel, you teased us a little bit in your presentation about uh, you know, regional exploration uh, with regard to uh, if you characterize black water as low to intermediate sulfidation, epithermal, you presented some data. What are the implications for regional exploration? Yeah, I think uh, from an outsider's perspective looking in, it's just Im important to know that if we do classify this as low to intermediate sulfidation, um, it's not going to be the typical thing that we're trained to look for as field geologists. You know, if we go down to New Zealand and we go study all the centers and we look at these beautiful banded coliform veins and hydrothermal breaches, um, the, that's, that's not probably what we're going to be looking for. If we're looking for a capoose or a blackwater style deposit, uh, that's not to say you wouldn't take a sample and assay it if you do run across it, but um, we, People, new explorers coming to the region just need to be aware that this is a little bit different. And instead of looking for those sorts of features, uh, you might want to look at zinc in soils or take some stream sediment samples or do some till sampling um, and, and look at base metal chemistry and, uh, as well as gold. So it's a little bit different. Um, in terms of folks that are established working there like us, uh, we've found the age dating to be incredibly useful to help us piece together the story. Uh, Joel's work, Aaron's work, uh, putting together a mineral paragenesis, uh, keying into that green sericite event, um, that's a unique, unique thing to look for. Um, so I, I think there's still a lot left to understand about Blackwater that can help regional exploration going forward, but those are, those are a few things that come to mind. A little bit of a comment uh, came in uh, again from the Smithers area for Fred, and uh, I'll get you, Fred, you to uh, read that and uh, perhaps provide a little more insight or uh, recognition of, uh, of, of Peter and his thoughts on the use of uh, a public uh, airborne EM surveys. I don't know if you can read that, but I agree with everything he says. <laughs> Basically, what he's saying is that the uh, airborne EM is underutilized, and I think it is. Um, he, he only knows of the work that he's doing and I've, what I've done to really help with those data to do some prospecting on the ground. Just, just following up, you said that of the six EM anomalies that you followed up, five of them had alteration? They had some kinds of alteration. Some of it, was, as I said, was really high level. Opal, for example, in, in vesicles in the, in the volcanics. And many of those didn't turn out to have any metals in them, so they didn't really tweak us to do anything with greater depth. Uh, others, the Kennedy, Kennedy folks had already found, and they showed up in some of the analysis that I did. And, and some of them hadn't shown up on anything that they'd found before and did have some high level alteration, and then we found the Fred. It has even a bit lower and lots of it. Right. So, like, there's EM anomalies everywhere, right? Like, you know, I don't know, 40 percent of the of the area is anomalous, essentially. So, how do you indicate which ones of those things you would actually follow up on? That's why I use the magnetics as well. I use both of them and correlated the two. And what correlated in this particular one, I think I identified like 14 or 15 areas in that region southwest of Vanderhoof, north east of Blackwater, that I said these these would be worth looking at in the field. And we, will, we looked at six of them because that's all we had time for in the 10 or 12 days I was there. And one of them was the Fred, and that's caused Kootenai Silver to pursue that with great earnest. Um, could there be more? I suspect there are. Okay, uh, any last questions? We've got a couple minutes left, otherwise it's, uh, it's coffee time. Anybody else from the floor? And uh, I see nothing else online. Very good. So uh, it's coffee time. Uh, let's get back here. I think it's in about 20 minutes. Somebody will start pushing you back in. Thank you very much. Session one is complete. <laughs>